Alrighty, everyone. Hello, hello, and welcome back. Um, I think this is the first session, uh, or episode. Game. This is the first episode, um, <laughs> that I have actually presented in my new 9 p.m. slot. Um, so, uh, welcome to everyone who uh was generally playing a game during my pre time slot and is not at this time of night. Uh, so, so glad you could be here. Um, super excited uh, to be in this time slot. It gives me a lot of, I don't know, flexibility to do shit in the middle of the day. Um, but uh, super excited today to have on uh, my guest, uh, Cameron Day, or do you for Cam? Yeah. Cam works perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, yes, so uh, Cam has made a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, including, it turns out, um, something that I bought solely because there was a fox on the cover. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Kim, why don't you give a brief introduction for yourself? Yeah, so, hello, uh, ladles and jelly spoons. Um, I am Cam Day of Daylight Publications. When I'm not publishing oodles of stuff, I am a uh, middle school history teacher full-time. Um, so, getting ready for the school year to start back up again yay um not stressed at all uh so but um pretty much i got started in doing rpg stuff i mean i've been playing since i was about 12 11 um dming most of the time here Robert, uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then when I got to, when I started up my podcast that, you know, I wrapped up a few, uh, a couple months ago, I started reviewing stuff on the guild and then I got kind of like, Hey, why don't I make some of my own stuff? Uh, and then October of 2019, when I was a senior in college, I got started publishing some stuff. My first book was voice of the gods, which was a, uh, a, it was four subclasses tied into descent into Avernus. Cause that was the big adventure then, I've um, and it was really fun doing that with Brian Holmes and uh, my buddy Ruben Cardenas did all the art. And uh, we did a cool thing in the back with using a Nokian glyphs uh, as a magic system in it. Um, and then from there, it became an addiction, could've... a crippling, crippling addiction. You could have gone with uh, Gregorian chants. They were popular. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh covid hit obviously i it was the spring of spring of my senior year i was doing student teaching so i had just completed my first eight weeks of student teaching uh then it was spring break for college i was going to stay on campus to still student teach and then it was like oh this covid thing's getting really bad i went home didn't come back to college for several months so i graduated college at home uh and over the course of that time my buddy adam hancock uh was like talking in the dms guild creative server but like hey how do we do costume vigilantes in in 5e and someone tagged me and was like huh, what i'm here what do you need i have arrived uh, <laughs> i built a server we did our first book supers and sorcery during the summer of covid and now i'm here doing way too much during the first summer of COVID. The first, the first summer of COVID. I know, I know. I didn't want to make a correction. I didn't, I didn't. I know. The really first, didn't. the first year. The yes. First. Uh, Supers and um, was actually the first thing um, that I uh, explicitly had created prior to ever talking to you <laughs> um, from our good friend adam <laughs> oh, what a gem what what a gem uh yeah spoke to adam uh many moons ago now on the show and got a chance to chat and um he was just absolutely you know abusive with praise um for it uh especially because like at that point in time like we were seeing a lot of 5e stuff out there um and a lot of more like uh, other property genres kind of smoosh mm -hmm. onto it. But like you said, not so much superheroes. Yeah. And that was the, when we went into making Supers and Sorcery, because that was kind of really the first time, like, 
we really went whole hog. Like we actually were like, oh, we're into Kickstarter. Okay, let's roll with it. Um, and the whole thing we did is when we went into doing Supers and Source, we were like, listen, we're not going to try and like make comic books completely work in 5e because we were kind of going into it with the idea that you as a pc are already a superhero mm -hmm. you're pretty much are you are above average you are a, a suit you are a hero so all we did was just take the comic flavor and then build a world that had homages to to comic books and a lot of people were very grumpy about that they were like, nah, I don't mean you, you, you. I'm like, go play me in some masterminds if you want. If you really want that crunch, go do that. Or you can play masks. Yeah. Um, we had one person comment on the product page. It was like, yeah, so I backed this. And I was really confused when I saw that it said it was a setting. And then I got the book and it was a setting book. And I was sitting there going, how do I respond to this comment? And, <laughs> and not just be like, you just answered your own question. Um, the Kickstarter page might have might really have stated said. this is a setting. Just maybe. Just maybe. Or 5e. Yeah. yeah. Uh, setting. A beautiful setting. Um, Beacon. The glowing metropolis sitting on the ancient alien world. Yep. Yep. So we, we had a lot of fun doing that. And then, like, we were wrapping up production of that. And I was like, hey, Adam, I got another idea for another Kickstarter. He goes, you go do it, man. I'm tired. <laughs> I need a break. So that's that was comments and cockpits, which we wrapped up uh, back in back in May. Uh, we wrapped that up, and Adam of course, is still tired. Yes, Adam is still tired, considering you're holding his newest baby, which I also just got in the mail, which is a fucking chonker. Chongus. This is a heckin' chonker. It's a chonker of a book. Um, which, if none of you have gone and checked out, those who wander. You're missing out. Uh, you definitely should. Yeah, this is the this is the segment of the show that's a love story to Adam. Yes, Adam and Vic. Yes. and the, all the work they did on that amazing book. So definitely, if you guys have not go and check that out. Um, if you've got a giant space in yourself that needs filling, then you can get my two books for comets and cockpits, which I have challenged Adam will be larger than. Than those who watch. <laughs> I don't. We'll see. I don't think this is a competition we need to have. No, no. And then we just look at Daniel, who did Zweihander, and we're like, you know what? He can just he he takes the cake. He wins. Um, and then so just between Kickstarters, you know, I'll do smaller stuff, and then that is how you know we are here chit chatting now. So. Yeah, and you have done smaller stuff, lots and lots of smaller stuff. As a matter of fact, you have one hundred and one items available on the dm's guild i feel embarrassed when you say that number because it makes it sound like i don't have a life <laughs> i i was stating it as an accomplished i know i just just some my fiance would say you don't have a life um like, you are uh and you started in 2019 um mm -hmm. which is fine uh because i just interviewed uh just penley of underground oracle they started in and they have a, a, a larger number yes than. yeah jess and keith are wild they are they're <laughs> for everyone who keeps seeing me do this there is a fly <laughs> the entire no, show is gonna the... be me trying to catch it <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and the, the smaller stuff i mean that's how i got my start and it's always still fun to me we got a couple ongoing series that we do um arena of champions uh we've got the blood of immortals series that we've got going on um we're working on a new series for supers and sorcery and um then i've got sort of little things i'm doing for like you know reinventing some 5e races and then doing my um sort of my homages to 4e which uh is the edition where i first wetted my teeth upon Oh, you're a uh, you're a four E fan. Yes, and I will always love four E. Get many of those around these parts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I I got into D and D like I said when I was about eleven or twelve, and I got into it because a family friend of ours was a professional storyteller. You know, lived in the same hometown as we did up in northern New Hampshire, and uh, 
he had this huge box of D and D stuff like two E three E 3.5 four E just like this amalgamation of stuff. And he gave it to me and he was like, it's like, he was British. He goes, consider it on permanent low. And I was like, Ooh. Um, and I just, and that was my gateway and I've never looked back since, but for you was always really fun because it felt and I know a lot of people don't like it because of it felt more like a video game. It felt it did. everything was more powerful. Everything was more intense, more energetic. You had powers, that whole thing. Um, but I really think where 4E, you know, some of the big areas that it really was good at was really helping DMs learn how to build stories, how to build campaigns, how to build NPCs, how to actually like flesh the world out. And then for players, really giving high level play, which we don't have a lot of in 5e. You know, most games usually after 10th level kind of fizzle out. <laughs> some go longer. I mean, I've got some high level games going, but I have to make my own stuff work because there isn't really anything in 5e for it. Um, and that's really what led me to do. You arrive at a tavern where. Yes. You- looking through the Dungeon Master's Guide 2, which I have over here from 4E, and really diving into and thinking about, because I've heard so many folks be like, oh, I want to learn how to DM. I don't know how to. I don't know where to. So I'm like, okay, I've been playing for like 12 years, almost half my adult life. Maybe I have some knowledge I can help. <laughs> and Maybe. then that's why I decided to, to write that. And I've got the beautiful uh, cover for You Arrive at a Tavern. Um, currently, on hiding my face, uh, so everyone can. Uh, it is a, you know, we start with the beginning here, um, and it's it's. Before you even open it, um, so uh, drop the link to that as well. As you, that. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful uh, cover, which gets you right into kind of the, the, the playing on the common trope of, you know, you open most games, it, it's a trope for, but um, often the words that open any campaign, you arrive at a tavern, or as you're in, you wake up at a cell, you rouse yourself from sleep, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, but that's just the starting place. Um, from there, you know, it is often very confusing for a new DM. Like, okay, um, we've started. We did our character introduction. Um, well, I have a party. Where? Yeah, where do you? Yeah, where do we there? go? I will say it was very hard not to slip a Skyrim meme into the title of oh you're awake <laughs> but uh i i resisted i resisted. so yeah because that was the whole thing is that you know i have and i was especially thinking about some of my kids some of my students um last year were big D D kids and a lot of them would always talk about you know oh you know we get like two or three sessions in then we don't know where to go um and i'd see tons of folks on twitter being like oh my gosh i want to try dming and then I remember myself when I first started DMing, it was hard to get beyond those first like two or three sessions because there wasn't a, it didn't feel like there was a way to keep the steam going. And so I kind and over the years, I've really been a big fan of City of Mist, which if folks have not played City of Mist, you need to pronto. Uh, it is a fantastic, extremely narrative based uh, game, urban noir, uh, urban urban fantasy crime noir art's fantastic oh i could rant all day about it but the really big thing about city of mist is that it focuses so heavily on narrative everything you do builds into the narrative um even the smallest actions which is something that i really like and the fact that city of mist is built to feel like a movie or a tv show it's very specifically built like that and it's kind of where you start with this like Mm -hmm get into it like first steps figuring out like what kind of campaign do i want to like you said you got your made for tv your mini series television show your cinematic universe which uh 
So, <laughs> uh, kudos to any DM who's making a cinematic universe in their campaigns. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, and really, the, the idea behind that is that because, you know, TV is very, TV and movies are very easy to equate to. And I figured it would make it sort of as I did played more City of Mist, that is how I came to view more of my sessions as episodes, you know, parts of smaller seasons, that kind of thing. And that's why I thought, you know, moving it into sort of that, those different splits of made for TV movie, miniseries, long form TV, cinematic universe would be easy for new DMs to really wrap their head around and figure out, okay, this is how I can kind of build it. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, that that is, it's very relatable. It's a, it's a media form that we're all pretty so into uh, kind of, you know, thing once you get figured out how you want to run your very hopes kind of plot, um, you know, do you have like, an, you know, do you have a wall with push pins and red string or mm -hmm. do you have a couple of bullet points that you're like, these are the cool things and, um, uh, or somewhere eventually uh, and you know that's really just the the start and i think you know you've done a really excellent job kind of breaking it down in an easy to understand format for someone who um unlike us maybe didn't pick up role-playing games until uh until, until after the before times after the before times yes <laughs> well i mean after when COVID happened, a lot of folks started playing more D&D &D and role-playing games in general. And I mean, I think the surveys that Wizards puts out were sort of a big kind of like wake up call of this is what folks are doing while they're remote. Um, I think one of the, the really fun things I did in uh, you, you Arrive at a Tavern was talking about how to handle different types of PCs, which I think with the, my macro and micro. So macro PCs are the idea of you have these folks that only give you a couple sentences, a backstory, and that's about it. Micro PCs are folks like myself who give you like a small novella as a backstory. <laughs> and then- You do both? A little bit of both. Yeah, and, and some folks, some folks can flip between both. And then I think one of the big things as a DM is knowing how to work with those two different kinds of players because you're gonna have those kinds of folks at your table. Um, and sort of the tips of how to work with either one, but then also on um, later in, I get into how to make combat interesting, you know, making sure that the combat tells a narrative story and isn't just, yay, roll, yay, roll, that there's actually something behind it because as a heavy RPer, when I do play, combat gets very boring for me because it's like, hey, what? what, my turn? Oh, okay. Edge blast. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe um, Warlock is not the most exciting combat option. No, I did make a bar block though once, a barbarian warlock combo, and he was a blast. So much. Fun. I have a simple fighter, uh, hand crossbow, you know, archery, sharpshooter expert. And uh, as far as like, you know, technically speaking, like, it is certainly one of the most boring uh, combat types, but um, I find that she's rather interesting in combat because she's a gnome, as Lily, and she has her trusty steed Lloyd, um, who is a goat, and they interact with the entire field of combat. We need to, you know, we, we bleat, we dash across the battlefield. <laughs> um, Stop and eat a can. Yeah, you know, stop and find out, like, is this, like, impassable vegetation, or is it edible? Mm -hmm. Very important, you know, distinction that we need to make. Uh, yes, I realize we're in combat, DM. Thank you. <laughs> so that was one of the big things of that. And then also, what I put with it is another big thing is tracking your NPCs, because you can get very overwhelmed with NPCs. So I kind of broke it down into three different types of your antagonist NPCs, background or supporting cast, and then background cast. Um, and sort of built a little formula around it on how many to have for each PC. 
Um, Cause you can make some, you know, anyone can throw together some very like, this is insert Cockney Tavern owner NPC that I think all of us have done at some point or another. Um, I don't know. With I don't do a very good Cockney accent. Uh, or you know, Scottish or Irish tavern keeper, one of one of the dwarven tavern keeper, but then also realizing like NPCs can be great tools yes. for telling your story, and so I kind of put examples in there with a couple of faux characters, uh, faux PCs, um, and there I some of the things that I put with it was an NPC tracker, so DMs have something to actually track NPCs and a campaign tracker of like, you know. What is your plot hook? What kind of form are you doing? Are you doing soft plot or hard plot? Um, it was also just, it was just really fun. And it also kind of let me turn my movie making brain on because I have a certificate in documentary filmmaking. So I got to like turn that brain on a little bit when I was working on it, so. And I think one part that, you know, really in intrigued me um, because it was decidedly not how I would do things was your NPC Asian? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, like, you've got for every PC, you want four antagonists, seven support cast, and ten background cast. Party for seven. And that just seems like a lot of people. I think, though, a lot of it, like, the, the caveat that you need to be there is that it's definitely going to depend on the kind of campaign. you got to go back to part mm -hmm. one, like, in a, a TV miniseries of you know a limited run series, uh, Doctor Strange and um, yes. then we're maybe gonna have you know a few less of those and maybe a lot more background cast. Yeah, you don't want to overwhelm and like you know this isn't if as an equation, but much like everything else with D and D, um, equations can be broken. <laughs> more like guidelines. Yeah, that great line. They're more like guidelines. Yes, uh, but no, really. Uh, like like any equation, um, you have to consider your variables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the reason we had kind of because I chatted with a bunch of friends of mine who've been DMs for a while, and we figured that equation because you don't have to have all of those NPCs out at one time. You no. can kind of have a have like a rolodex, and the way we were kind of figuring is that. If you building a good campaign, every player kind of gets center stage every couple sessions. So every every character should kind of have their own little arc. And that's when you can kind of like fade out some of the other PCs characters or other PCs and PCs and then start to bring in some of the other ones. So kind of again, but again, for, for someone like me who runs very big, very dense ones, that's a pretty normal equation. But for some folks, you are right. It might be for your campaign, it might be easier to shift it down some or, you know, only use a majority of one kind of P NPC and then majority of another kind. And and two, um, the other variable that I've got, you know, in my mind here is, you know, how new are your players to being players? And like, how much are they wanting to like, retain and be like intimately familiar with every single character like if they want to become like best friends and keep track of every npc you come along with you're probably going to want to pare down the number mm -hmm. and that's where your micro or mac uh, yeah. macro pc comes in because macro pcs probably aren't going to give you a lot to work with micro pcs probably will and then you can or the change. macro the macro pcs you're going to go on a quest and they're going to meet someone and they're going to just like you know okay whatever and then, like six sessions later, I really liked that. And you're like, "You could have told me." <laughs> We've gone one thousand miles away from him, and suddenly mm -hmm. you're like, "He was a pretty swell dude. He had some good ideas." I'm like, "Oh, look, he happened like, to open a tavern right down the road." And I'm like, "Oh, were you? Were you? Did you strike up a conversation with him when you went up to get drinks?" Yeah, no, totally. That would have been brilliant, but you know, again, <laughs> um, you know, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe it's not him. Maybe, you know, like he made this, you know, thick ass stew and you're like, God, I really miss it. I've gone two continents away. And you're, like, you're like, 
But guess what? It was a family business. <gasps> just like that uh, that Adam Driver meme of the good soup. <laughs> just that one that one line. Um, but then after I did you ride a tavern, I was like, okay, well, this is for DMs. So now I want to do. So what is your story for players? Um, and then so they kind of go together. The thing was though, with you arrive at a tavern. I would most of my stuff usually like tanks and usually like doesn't do too hot. Um, then the 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 D and D official Twitter retweeted you arrive at a tavern, and I was kind of like, uh, uh, mm, oh, okay then. Like I didn't really register it at first, and then I, sh- I shared it with some friends, and they were like, dude. <laughs> this is cool and i was like i yeah i'm like just processing this right now uh, yeah. it's not uh yeah not real yet Give me a- yeah. and then it was it was copper in in three days and i was like this is the fastest i've ever had something get a medal and it's it like it's continuing to grow and grow like it's just it will probably hit silver within the next couple of days which i was like i'm not prepared yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of nice because it gives you the funds uh, to create uh, the rest of the series. The inevitable rest of the series. Yes, yes, the uh, inevitable rest. Yes. Um, you, know, you know, speaking of the rest of the stuff, it gives you, you know, time as well to go and create more of all of these other little things that you've gotten. And I imagine you've had um, maybe not a sizable uptick in purchases on the rest of it, but you've gotten a, a couple of per- that, you know, your sales uptick from uh, being retweeted by the Dungeons and Dragons. Um, yes. And, you know, that's good because you've got a um, hundred and one things that uh, that can be theirs now for the low, low price of uh, mostly less than $5. I, I, I don't know if you actually have anything. A couple uh, things, but not. Yeah. Not- I didn't I didn't sort it by price. Uh, so. Um, no, one of the one of the first bigger books we did was with when you had Ryan on Ryan Langer. Um, he and I did Root and Twig, uh, which was a fun little book where we did a bunch of subclasses and our first ever original class where both he and I were like Duh, brain dead by the end of it. Um, all inspired by sort of Celtic tree divination and the American timber industry. Um, and that was really fun just because, you know, I have family you know, go way back to the logging industry in the 1800s and stuff. Um, like you live in New Hampshire. Yeah, <laughs> if you thought my car is covered in New Hampshire bumper stickers, but you wouldn't think I live in New Hampshire. Um, but that was really fun. And uh, so that was kind of, that was a, a fun project. And then I have stuff today, like the thing I just dropped today, the Bic moves, my minotaurs that were my revisited minotaurs. Because... We only ever have one kind of cow for Minotaur. I was like, but there are so many types of cows. Here are yes, five there are. There are there are a plethora of cows. I uh I don't I didn't even learn all of the non-dairy cows, just dairy cows alone. Um <laughs> dog is very Neil. Oh. <laughs> um, I didn't even learn all of those, oh. but um just with the dairy cows alone, there's like, you know. Dozens, dozens of breeds. Um, yeah. Um, and so, you know, you've got, uh, you know, a lot of options here. Um, I think, <laughs> I think though that that's something that people think about, right? So, like, you've got your Aarakocra and people are like, okay, I can be, or I can be Raven row or whatever but you're like okay so we have all of these other animal themed races or you know animal based races and you're like um you know much like aarakocra and tabaxi you can be you know a calico uh you know a tortie yeah. like you can do that with any animal there there is never just one like or even like well you know i'm doing it it's based on a deer okay what kind of deer yeah, there's not just one kind of deer. What do you What do you and, mean? Well, what deer is it? A, a white-tailed deer, like the most common in North America, or or well, like a moose or an elk? Well, those aren't deer, but that's true. That's true. 
They're just big. Oh, I had I also, once had someone tell me moose are just big deer, right? And I was like, also like, like okay, so we'll say for instance deer, right? Deer, deer, deer is about the length of my nose, right? Moose, yes. <laughs> yes. Elk, it is not deer size. If you've never yeah. seen an elk or a moose, um, don't approach. A student of mine once asked, Mr. Day, how come we haven't domesticated moose? And I was like, you know what, kiddo? You go do that and you get back to me with how well that goes. We live in the land of the moose. We are but visitors to their domain. Huh. We, we are here on their time. When the like, moose choose to revolt. If horses had had antlers, we never would have domesticated them either. No, definitely not. Um, but yeah, one of the, the, the I've always loved Minotaur. Um, especially I used to play a ton of World of Warcraft when I was a kid and I loved playing Tauren just because they were so different because they weren't they were buffalo and that's what I really liked about them also I could I just chilled out in Thunder Bluff so much and didn't go questing I just I just lived in Thunder Bluff and I was like can I just please just suck me in game so I can live here um it has such beautiful views Ugh, so and the music was always good but that was one of the things is with minotaur and then my dad used to work for a guy who had highland cattle who are some of the most friendly and most chill cows ever um and so that got me thinking and i was doing this you know i was, I was doing this book of on uh, a new kind of three cream that i did uh with gordon McAlpin, and we did that but we based it on ants so I did a bunch of ant research and ants are wild. Let me tell you, ants are crazy. Oh. Um, so we did that. And then I got the bug and I was like, hmm. So then I did the Minotaur one. And with the Minotaur ones, we have bison, water buffalo, yak, muskox, and highland cattle cultures for the Minotaur. We re- I renamed them the Big Moose. And I changed their lore up a little bit. So they're not as like demon cows from within a maze. They're a little bit nicer. Um, well, okay, in 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 my you know alternate universe, they're only demon cow because they're trapped in a maze. Wouldn't you be angry? This is true. The cool thing, so with with the maze concept, with the big moves, with the maze concept, we took it and we made it so that the maze is actually a giant library, and they Super store. Super easy to get lost. Stuck. Yeah. So in library. stuck. Oh gosh, I cannot leave. How dreadful. How dreadful. No, there's books everywhere. Um, and so we played with that and that was really fun. And then that got me thinking of, I was running an Eldraine game. I, I took the magic setting of Eldraine and turned it into a D&D setting, which is really fun. And one of my players was playing a Triton and we realized there's no fish variations for Tritons. Tritons are sea elves. Why do you not have like aquatic variations for Tritons? So now I'm like, okay, I'm going to make a saltwater and I'm going to make a freshwater triton book of different fish so i just love the idea of like a salmon triton just being like yo i'm so cool and then this rainbow trout i go against the stream yeah and then the the rainbow trout's like i'm the same color as you dude you just swim upstream and you're cooler than me but it doesn't just it's literally just an excuse to do little homages to where i grew up and how weird fish are no, um, and and I think I think that's great, and I think you know that the things that are unique about where we live are definitely things that we're on. And for everyone who's not familiar with Highland cows, by the way, if you've seen the pictures in the internet of the emo cow with like the sad sweat bangs because he's so shaggy, uh, that is indeed a Highland cow, and I have posted one of the variety of emo cow photos. Um, this one is from Australia. Uh, but um, they're so cute, and it just makes me want to comb their hair. <laughs> they're they're very cute, and they're very friendly. And we actually in in the Bic Moose, we have the Highland Cow variants. They they build taverns, they build inns, but they also second as schools. And so they run these tavern schools where they teach others about uh, Bic Moose culture, and they sort of welcome people in. They teach them their language and their history. Um, so it was just a, it was a, a fun little spin. The the muskox ones that we do, uh, they do not speak. They use sign language. Um, so we wanted to weave that in as a cool little because they're out in the tundra. Speaking wastes heat, 
So they're just like, we just sign. Um, and then the yaks are like mountain climbers and uh, the water buffaloes are martial artists. And the bisons are just nomads who make giant hill paintings and stuff. So it was fun. And uh, Francesca Rowan's art uh, is just fantastic. Yeah, uh, so question from the uh, from chat. Um, yes. Aren't the Highland cows the ones who love to be uh, your singing and music? They do. Highland, so Highland cows are really, really social. They're probably one of the most social breed of cow. And I can remember many times when I was younger, I, my dad would pick me up from school and we'd have to go and we'd have to take care of something. And he would have to stop by one of the fields, check on them and his music would be playing out of his car. And the Highland cows would come over and I'd be petting them and scratching them. And they kind of bob their head a little bit to uh, the music. And so they, they, are, they are definitely the most social. Holsteins though are bastards. Holsteins are mean and nasty. Uh, they're, those cows are assholes. They're terrible, mean cows. Uh, uh, Jersey for, cows, though. For everyone okay. not familiar um, with cattle, uh, Holstein <laughs> is the traditional black and white cow that you... Yes. Cows. Um, and that is absolutely correct. Uh, they, they are, are big, giant... Jer yes. Jersey cows, which are, uh, were from Jersey, England, and there is one farm in Vermont, the Billings Farm, which is the premier breeder of jerseys here in North America. Um, they have, if you're ever in Vermont, you should definitely go check it out. It's really cool. They have a huge dairy farm, but jerseys are very friendly. They're very kind, very sweet. Um, but Highland cows are just better because they're shaggy and hairy and just look adorable. So. I, I do like the, the jersey. That really nice, like, sable color. And they have... Um, their faces cute and I'm like like they're always inquisitive looking. They just have that face shape. Um anyways. <laughs> that you guys have just come to hear Ginny and Cam just talk about various different animals. That's what this has just turned into. <laughs> yes. Uh we're, yes. We're, and next we're here to talk about Angus cattle. Um, the kind that stand in the fucking road at night too often. And they just look at you and they're like, oh, I'm in your way. Ask I'm me sorry. how I know. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to move around me. No, I'm not moving. You are. Uh, I, I grew up, uh, for those uh, in a very rural area, part of the city, and there was a very large black Angus uh, cattle farm uh, down the road from me. Um, and uh, the thing about being very rural for people who grow up there that when it's dark, it's dark. Oh yeah, it is. And um, there is a very There's not, but the moon to guide you. Heading toward my childhood home, there is a ninety degree curve um, that goes around the corner of the cow pasture, and then there's several like small of hills, um, and people tend to come very fast. For those small hills to 90 degrees and between those hills and the curve uh which has the deep ditch on the if you're coming from this is just directly in front of yeah. you this is like a rural america this is like rural farming america starter pack <laughs> it's where they like to slip their fence and stand in the road on pitch black night yep i only accidentally at all once. Uh, <laughs> headed to school, driving in my car. The roads were a little icy, which is very unusual. Um, we slid a little bit. Everything was well. I was handling it until my sister in the, in the passenger seat screams like bloody murder, shrieking. Uh, what do you do when you're driving and some freaks? Slam on the brakes. Slam on the brakes. What do you not do when you're on ice? Slam, Slam on, the on the brakes. Uh, so we gently careened, fortunately, not towards the giant ditch, but towards the cow pasture. I took down the cow fence and had to go drive over there after I got the car out of the little shallow ditch, drive over to the farmer and be like, hey, uh, I broke your fence, your cow's out. Like six of yeah. them. Yeah. So far. Six of them so far. 
I think in 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 New Hampshire and Vermont, you can get cow insurance. I think on your car. I think there's actually a little livestock collision. Yeah, is... I, I didn't have that. Um, we just <laughs> we just knew like drive slow there. Um, otherwise, you take your life into your own hands, and you have to pay for his cow if you. Can. Um, but uh, you know, we digress, obviously. But like you know, that kind of random off the wall trivia and stuff is like what you choose to make you content much like you have you've drawn upon that knowledge that you have of which yours is um you know way too much knowledge about cattle and fish and various other um i bet you could probably do a really great supplement about like uh berries and syrups probably <laughs> probably i could probably do one on trees too given that my parents are both foresters yeah. But I don't remember a lot about trees, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, but they would be so excited if you wanted to sit down and talk to them. I know, I know. <laughs> they are their passions. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, that kind of is like where we all draw our influence, right? So you're drawing your influence or inspiration from things that are familiar to you. You're like, well, I mean... Uh, everyone doesn't really realize there's a bunch of different cow types. It's not just the black and white asshole cow, so that's not what yes. all Minotaur look like. There are many brands, many breeds of asshole cow, and then there are nice cows. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so, in, in, you know, Minotaur, therefore, would be similar, because, uh, you know, there's obviously that uh, analog there. Mm -hmm. Somewhat. Close enough um <laughs> and you know you can kind of you could take that and kind of apply it to you know all sorts of stuff i mean which done um got you know uh you've got as you got you know your, your root and twig stuff you've, you've got um loads and loads of stuff where you've just kind of dove into the, like fine detail on stuff um different uh classes different little sub races different domains and like these are you know it's it's a very good niche to kind of create in because there are endless possibilities like okay so we've got our classes uh we don't class that's cool uh, take what you've got and I'll be like, all right, but like, why isn't there a cleric? Who... Yeah, the feast feast domain was was a fun one. Um, that was also kind of how I got my start. Was doing a very holiday themed uh, subclasses. Uh, sort of the first claim to fame was. Uh, the Great Gobbler, my celestial turkey warlock patron, uh, got featured on the D&D &D show with Greg Tito. Uh, <laughs> and I think I almost like had a heart attack and I was like, Mom, Dad, my, one of my things got featured. And they're like, oh, that's great. And then they went back to like doing whatever they were doing. Um, but I think Kai Linder was like, yo, dude, <laughs> your turkey got featured. And I was like, really? My turkey? <laughs> the Great Gobbler? Yes. Um, so that was, and then I had some Halloween ones, which were really fun. Um, the and Christmas you, ones were also fun too. And you keep saying, you keep saying the word fun there. And like, that's an important thing that a lot of people, you know, you get so focused on like, I want to create like the next bestseller. One, if you, as a person, anyone out there watching this, tell me, What's gonna be the next bestseller? I'll hire then you. You are like you are a prophet. Yeah, you... I, I I will I will pay you to tell me so that I can make it so that we can make money so that I can pay you to tell me what the next thing is. Um, but you know, there's so much focus on like making the next thing that like a lot of us lose sight of like, I just want to make this thing that's like ridiculous and fun. I want to make a, a uh like exceedingly ridiculous turkey um you know it 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 i'm thinking like you know take hey hey who you know from moana 
everyone yes, and just best, like make it into turkey. a turkey who's just like you know bashing his head on the ground he think i don't know <laughs> <laughs> And that, yeah, that's one of the things is when I started doing it, and even to this day, um, like when, even with our big books, like I always want it to be about fun first, because even though, you know, I did, we do make a lot of money off of our big books and, you know, I have to, for tax reasons, have to set it up as a business and do all the, the adult things, which I don't want to do, but I have to, uh, it's still about fun. It's not about making money for me. It's always been about just goofing off and working with tons of different artists and different writers and different people and just making things that are fun. like, I pour tons of time and tons of effort into them. But at the end of the day, I just want everyone to have fun with it. Um, and if, if you start in on a project and it just starts being like a complete drag and you Red working on it, like I imagine, much like me, unless you've made a contractual obligation and you feel um, required to complete it, um, mm -hmm. and the person that you were working with, you know, unable, because generally they're willing, but sometimes they're unable to change things so that it can all be fun again for you. Yes. Uh, if it's not fun, you just be like, all right, we're just going to put you in the trash bin for now. Maybe later it'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah, I've got plenty of stuff that, you know, has started, kind of fizzled out, but I've, you know, hung up to to put away later. And then sometimes, you know, there's some stuff I just publish because I'm just like, I just, I have this idea in my brain. I just need to get it out, get it out of there before I forget. Um, like, I think when I did my little series, the heroic uh, Paragon Epic series I did, that was just like, it was a bug in my brain. I was like, I love this stuff from 4E. Just got to get it out of my system, publish it. Boom. If people buy it, great. I just need to get it on a page. Um, and I mean, that one of the other things I like to do is I like to pull from pop culture, mm -hmm. which I don't think happens enough. So, I mean, the expeditionary is a perfect example of literally one afternoon I was watching Road to El Dorado and I was like, I just want to make a class that's Miguel and Tulio. I that's know. I want to do. Miguel and Tulio. Uh, and so I just like, I texted a friend of mine, Alex Coggin, and I was like, Hey, Alex, you want to do art for this? She was like, sure. Then I texted my friend, Lydia uh, Van Hoy. I was like, Lydia, do you want to do layout fish? She was like, sure. And then we did it. And it was just like the, the cover was great. Cause we had Alex, this perfect homage to Miguel and Tulio. And it was, that was one that was just fantastic um but there was like the whole fun thing is there were plenty of times i have been told like oh you know your stuff is too overpowered your stuff that doesn't isn't balanced your stuff isn't this and i'm like yo muchachos i'm here to have a good time yeah if you don't want to buy my stuff because it's unbalanced you don't have to but i i, I particularly remember one moment when i started doing a bunch of bionicle stuff in eberron and I had one guy write me and go, yeah, so Bionicles don't belong in Eberron. Like you can do them elsewhere, but they, they don't belong in Eberron. And I'm like, where the fuck else am I going to put Bionicles in D&D? Eberron's like the perfect place. <laughs> First off, um, is his name Keith Baker? No. no. Then I don't know if he technically is the, um, the arbiter yeah. of it, what does it, or does not. If you are not Papa Keith, then I'm not going to listen to you because I only listen to Papa Keith. And um, I only know Keith a little bit, but I feel pretty confident in the fact that Keith would probably tell you, does it make you have fun in Everon? All right. <laughs> yeah. Do it. So <laughs> that, was, that was, and then I remember uh, Critical Bard, I think when I launched my big Bionicle book, <laughs> He retweeted and I was like, oh, so cool. All right. We've gotten, uh, you know, we've gotten uh, a heck yeah. Put some Autobots in there. Oh, I did. Yeah. I did. Look up, look up the Primex, the Primex, Warforged the Primex. That is my, that is my uh, Transformer uh, Warforged on my, I had weight. I love Eberron. Like that is literally the D&D setting that got me through middle and high school. If I had not read it, I probably would not be here. So I put a lot of love into Eberron. Yeah. And you know, I and for and something that you've gotten here on your on your website that a lot of people don't do that makes it kind of easy to go through here is um I've linked your DMs guild page too, but 
you've okay. broken them down by these categories that you're talking about, which kind of helps, you know, people to, okay, so, you know, I really like the, you know, geek, immortal theme stuff, or, or this, you know, big champion fighters, or your pop culture versions and you all of your various holiday themed stuff um I just love, actually i just love some of the art for your i don't know who I, I haven't opened them all to see who did the art on each it is great um well, i make sure to link on one of the things on the website that i'm very that i always make sure to do is i always try to link all the artists i work with yeah so any i need to you know catch up on a little bit because i have some more folks i got to link um, but any artist I work with that you see that you're like, sweet, I wish I could use for them. You can go to my website and get info to go to their website to talk to them. Um, I think as of right now, I've worked with like almost 80 different artists on all of my stuff. So. And they are also all 100% definitely credited on DM skill. And you can click on it there to see the other DM skilled stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want more examples of their awesomeness before you message them. Um, and, and yeah, no, absolutely. Definitely. You've, you've gone to, you know, like great strides here. Uh, the artist of daylight publications you've got there. Um, and it is a list more coming, always more coming. Oh yes. Um, and, <laughs> and I think, yeah, I, I, I think back to the Eberron conversation there. Um, she, you know, Chili Draw says that everyone's an easier entry point in opinion than Rotten Realms for players. And I think that, you know, to an extent, like, that's that's true, because the Forgotten Realms, um, less Ed Greenwood, but, like, there is a lot going on, and it is more traditional, traditional Tolkien high fantasy stuff, and, yeah. like, it all is so interwoven together that it can definitely be a little overwhelming. Whereas, like, Eberron, like, it's got lore. It's got, you know, loads of lore. But it's also set up to where it's, like, you know, the big thing, like, you know, as a new player, you'll come in, you'll keep people, like, the morning, the morning, and you're like, well, what, what calls the morning? Yeah. Great question! We what do you think caused it? Know. Okay, this is, this is, this is what it is. Cataclysmic event and now blah blah blah. And so, what do you think caused it? That's the big mystery. Yeah, um, I think Eberron. Eberron is great because, and it's more steampunky. Yeah. Well, one. I mean, one of the things is that I love genre mash. Anything that just is genre mashy, Chef's kiss. And one of the great things that Keith Baker did with Eberron is that, and you can say this about a couple of the other settings. But really what's nice about Eberron is that you have access to every genre of game you want in Eberron and it doesn't feel forced. Like it doesn't feel like you're really like if you want a horror game, oh, I have oh. I have a group of friends who ran Curse of Strahd in Eberron and I think they did it like styled like an old west kind of thing out in the Talenta Plains. I was like, that is so cool. Uh, but and it, it, it wherever you want, you can go to an Eberron and you get that flavor, which is awesome. Like, you want some pulpy jungle adventure? You go to Zendrick or you go to Kabara. You want Wild West? You go to the Talenta Plains. You want Dark Souls? You go to Karnath. <laughs> you get your Dark Souls with your Russians and you go to Karnath. Yeah, um, you want, like, uh, you know, weird, you know, kind of out of the box, like, oh, you know, this area is controlled by demons and they can kind of just like vision what they want to be here and it is so it's mm -hmm. a little surreal and so pay no mind to any of the weirdness also like probably uh so you've got the whole or demon waste the do you whole want, demon waste do you want to go the, to the Maror holds where it's like noir dwarven cities where they wear eldritch monsters as fashion statements uh which is like one of the weirdest but greatest it's like yeah i got this like new tentacle it's real great it goes in my outfit and everyone else is like okay yeah you could do your you know your your classic um noir mystery thriller through sharn oh yeah um uh, you know and that's something i've really come to love doing recently is taking 
the hard covers because the, the, the thing is, is about Feyrun and Forgotten Realms the Forgotten Realms is very big the known realms is very small like the known realms is the Sword Coast and Icewind Dale and that's about it uh, uh. and Chult and, and, uh. and for people who play Adventures League you can't forget the Moon Sea true and the Moon Sea uh, with all of the shenanigans that goes on there I've never touched Adventures League I had a very bad experience and I never want to do it again oh. Already here though. Um, so we had we had so we I decided I was I was running a game and I it was one of the things I also love doing is I love taking magic planes like for magic gathering and turning them into little settings we can play in, which I hope that wizards does more of those. Wizards. Um but I was doing an Eldraine game, which if none of you guys ever played the Eldraine set, it was a very highly a uh, f- high fantasy fairy tale inspired setting. Probably one of the best sets that uh, Magic has ever had. It was a blast to play. I loved Eldraine and oh, like so um, that, yes. Yeah, the, uh, the, the quest mechanic was really cool. The, the food counters were really cool. The art was great. The, just everything about it was really awesome. So I was doing that with my Tuesday night group and we wrapped that up and I was like, ooh, let's try something different. So we rolled for a random setting and we rolled for a random hardcover adventure. And so starting uh, this week, we are going to begin our Tomb of Annihilation in Theros game. So everything about Tomb of Annihilation has been reflavored to work in Theros, which if many of you guys know what Theros is, it's the uh, Wizards Greek setting, really awesome setting. So I got that going on. Then for my Sunday game, we're doing Storm King's Thunder in Eberron. So reflavoring it, kind of with a little dash of Suicide Squad as well. And then for another game starting up, we're doing Ghosts of Salt Marsh in Ravnica. So that I've been having more fun with doing sort of the the, the really mashy stuff of uh, sort of just mod project stuff together. Um, but yeah, Eberron is so freaking. Yeah, nice. and. And if for everyone who wasn't familiar with the Remembered Realms, Forgotten Realms joke, I had that up briefly on the screen. Um, there. Uh, 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 and I will note that, again, this particular image has forgotten the Moon Sea, which is to the right of the Remembered Realms, there above the Inner Sea. If you want Abeleth pirates and all those. Um, but I think, you know, I really love... The, the magic lore and i think you know there's a lot of cool stuff that they explore and continue to bring over like i know a lot of people are all like or like how dare you get your magic in my dnd um first off uh we, we now have our dnd in their magic so you know pat um yeah. uh and if you haven't looked at i'm not gonna say everyone it's not playing magic isn't everyone's cup but looked at the uh, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms crossover. Like, highly recommend at least like pulling up, reading the cards, looking at the art. It we is a did really a draft. We did a draft, and it was a blast. Really well put together. Um, Alan and I did a um, an unboxing before uh, before it the collector boosters and the commander decks and a and a box of set boosters, and we got another box of set boosters. Um, and. <laughs> We did a we did a mock sealed. Got some packs. I got some packs, and we built a deck. Um, and we have enough cards to do that once more because nice. Um, fun. Yeah. Um, I used to be one of those folks that kind of was poo pooing on it, but then I you know it did sort of getting into publishing and sort of on a larger scale. It really just makes more sense. Like the, I used to always be like, oh, I wish they'd bring back some like, you know, some of the older settings, which at the end of the day, it doesn't really make much sense to do. Like that age of gamer is now the minority within the population that is playing D&D. It makes more sense from a, from a, from a marketing standpoint to publish these magic settings and make them hard covers when the folks that are playing D D are also the folks that are playing magic like also setting like the setting itself a setting itself is a very narrative thing mm-hmm. so 
I could go up into the library and pick up any of those setting books. Oh, yeah. And, like, boom. Setting is now 5th edition. Yeah. Uh, obviously, and... there's some tweaks for, like, setting specific classes and stuff that you need to... Con but, some like... The, the problematic issues of the older settings? There's some things that we also <laughs> just ignore. Um, Dark Sun. Um, yeah, cannibalism. Then, yeah. But then, like, I... Um, I mean, I don't know if you're aware, but I love the Theros stuff. Uh, I worked on i've got a thorough supplement out um alan and i and some of on, and we did a subclass thorough subclass for every uh class we also did um uh, a series of uh adventures loosely connected adventures um in the, in that book and some you know some magic items and some campaign tips for campaign and also like a a good a uh, big bad evil guy. I'll send. It. I don't want to talk about it because I have players who are playing through the saga with me. No worries, no worries. And um, yeah, that's that's one of the great things about Magic, though, is that they have world building teams for all of the sets. Like they have huge teams that do all the lore for the sets. Like my favorite is always going to be Ixalan. I love Ixalan. Oh, oh. Because I got my lore from the novels, right? Uh -huh. So, the Brothers War, Dominaria. Ah, it's my, it's my like, so good. I just love, I love Ixalan because dinosaur knights, vampire conquistadors, and pirates. Like, that's all I want. That I am a simple man with simple needs. And if I can have those three things, but I loved Ixalan. Um, I've been reading more of the lore from Kaldheim, which is their their Nordic themed uh, set, which the lore for that is super, super cool. Um, and originally Strixhaven, I was kind of like, eh. and then I started reading the lore. I was like, the colleges were founded by dragons and the colleges are owned by an owl person. Whoa. And so Strixhaven, I'm now, I have never pre-ordered like as many D&D &D books as I have the last couple, <laughs> last couple ones. Um, but it just, it makes more sense to pull from those because all the lore is already there. Just yeah. put it into a hardcover and, and, and plus each of the magic sets has a different flavor, which is great. And then you can like sort of just pick. And yeah, and, and these... we've had a, an excellent recommendation here. Let's go the other way. Let's get some Eberron magic cards. And I, for one, am in. Like, oh, yes. because you already have your built-in factions, right? You've got the, the dragon mark houses. And yep. so, like, yeah, Kaladesh mm -hmm. is my artificer, artificer jam. I mean, like, yes, Kaladesh, but like, okay, but like, Mishra I... and Urza are like the original artificers. Like, come on, Dominaria and Phyrexia and like the absolute. Phyrexia is terrifying. Phyrexia right, exactly. Is so Phyrexia, scary. Phyrexia is what happens. Artificers go bad, feel yeah. bad. Yeah, Phyrexia is like, what would happen if Termin if if Skynet did succeed fully? Um, but now I'm like, now I'm like trying to remember what color, what color mana would each of the houses be in Ebron? Um, I mean, yeah, the, the TLDR on Phyrexia for people who don't don't follow magic and aren't why it's so terrible. Artificial plane of mechanical biomechanical life, uh, an ecosystem comprised of metal, death, and tissue. A hellish world with an accelerated evolution of artifact creature. It is yep. also known as Green Hill and the Nine Hills. Yeah, pretty much it's what happens when, when artificers fuck around and find out too much. <laughs> I mean, you know. And um, poor, Car poor Karn just wanted to build it so he could have friends and then it all fell apart. I mean, it was it was a, it was a fairly nice place originally, kind of similar to to Meriden, and then Dogmoth arrived, brought there by a planeswalker, and um, oh, there was some magic, magic, magic lore is wild, y'all. And the cooler thing is, it's all interconnected because the last couple of years has all been Mister Nico Bolas building his plans. Can just by the way. Well, 
yeah, now he's in the spirit prison and Ugin took his powers and it's hilarious. He's like, I don't have my powers anymore. I also hate Ugin. Yeah, Ugin is also kind of like the number of times up. the number of times I've been sitting here at my desk playing arena, somebody has played Ugin and I've just been like, I'm not rage quitting this game and scooping right now, but fuck this. <laughs> Yeah, no, the, the, the coolest thing I found out, because I got this little book, uh, which just came out recently, which was the the history of the planes or a guide to the planes. It like literally just came out a couple of weeks ago. But like talking about how, because I didn't realize how all the different planes leading up to War of the Spark have been connected of how like in Kaladesh, Nico was building a planar bridge and Amon Ket, he's gathering all of the undead to fight for him. Then he used the planar bridge. Then he needs the immortal son in Ixalan. And I hadn't realized like, Oh my god, it's all connected! And all of this stuff, really, when you stop and think about it, you're like, is... Is is, is Halister? Nickel Bullock? And then you just have Jace, who's just like, Hi! Hi! I'm Jace! And you're like, go away! Hi, hello! I, I'm not sure if you remember me, but I'm very pretty. I don't remember myself 90% of the time, because I always seem to get amnesia all the time. Yeah, but Jace's thing is like, it's pretty. True, he is. He is very. He's yeah. very pretty. Okay. Although I'm more of an Ajani guy myself. Okay, pretty versus handsome. And yes, chiseled. Yes. Um. All right. Well, that said, uh, I'm sure you and I could go on and on about yes. uh, lore of magic <laughs> and various ways that we this end to D and D. Um. Yeah. So, uh, everyone who's out there, uh, if you've got a great idea for some like obscure magic lore and you want to bring it up and we want to talk about how to make it into a D D thing yes we we we, we would like to talk yeah M- maybe. this is going to become a new a new recurring series of us just figuring out magic stuff <laughs> this is what the, you're gonna have to make a, a patreon right <laughs> oh god oh, um god. but that said uh we are actually over our hour by you know eight minutes um <laughs> But I uh, just want to, again, thank you so much for being on the show, Cam. Uh, it thank has you. been an absolute delight. Uh, forward to seeing um, what else you come out with. Uh, speaking of that, um, I want to tell everyone uh, briefly what projects you have on the horizon that they can look for, where they can find you online, and just a little pressure on where they, where, where they can go and buy your shit now. Okay, so uh, the the speed run uh, next week, actually this week we've got tomorrow, um, this week we've got three new subclasses dropping for uh, the Blood of the Immortals series. That's where we take uh, ancient Greek pantheons, uh, not ancient, ancient Greek, Norse, uh, Celtic, um, Egyptian, and we're also starting on our Mesopotamian ones as well and take them, take the gods and turn them into subclasses. So we got that happening. Uh, then the I've got a new original RPG called Shepherd's Quest coming out in the next couple of weeks where you play as a shepherd. You select from six different types of sheep, six different farms, and you raise your sheep over the course of several seasons. And you learn more than you ever thought you needed about sheep. Yes, you do. Uh, and it can be played, it's solo play to six players. So you can play it by yourself or up to six players. Uh, we got that. I've um, got another one in development called Robo Noir, where you play as robotic versions of famous detectives from various medias. Of course, there is a Magnum PI robot. There has to be. Um, so that'll be coming along. And then the big thing we've got is our next big setting book, now that we're wrapping up stuff on comets and cockpits, is Spellpunk Solar and Sunder. That's going to be launching uh, Q1 of 2022 on Kickstarter. It is an element punk setting, uh, pretty much ancient world. They fuck around with technology, goes a little too far, open elemental rifts, elemental planes open up onto the world, and you play in the world several thousand years later that is now adapted to having elemental magic and technology work together uh so if any of you have watched that chobani commercial that was done by studio ghibli uh pretty much that uh it's very solar punk very hydropunk we have a super awesome diverse team on that one um i'm like the only cis dude which is awesome it's i plan to have a super diverse team we have a super diverse team um, and I'm really, really proud of that. So that'll be coming along. Uh, no SRD races, all original races, a whole new magic system, 
Um, you can play as a mammo swine. That's one of the races I made. You can just play as a boar, as a magical steam boar. Uh, yeah. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at, day, at Daylight Pub 1066, Battle of Hastings, biggest date I can remember. Uh, and you can go on to DMs Guild and Drive Through. Just look up Daylight Publications. It's a cute little dragon. Cute little, little dragon. His name is Rusty. Uh, and look for that logo with our stuff on it. So in closing, uh, he wants to know, please tell me the Magnum PI robot has a boss stash. Oh, his name is Stash with a three. I hope that answers your question. All right. Uh, <laughs> again, uh, you can, as always, find me um, online at Jenny Loveday on, um, you know, all of the things. Uh, <laughs> A website uh, where you can keep up to date on links to all of the amazing guests who have been on the show. Yeah. Uh, you'll have links to everyone there. You can catch up on the previous episodes. You can is upcoming. Um, we got a pretty awesome guest list upcoming. Um, next week, we're talking uh, who um done way too much stuff, um, but is probably as the creator for his Genesis, uh, the Ivy in Space, yes. Yep, Alligator Alley Entertainment. Yep. Yeah, and guy. Uh, and then after that, uh, we've got a pre-record um, with Matt Sanders. Uh, we will unfortunately not be live on the nineteenth. I will not be here at my desk capability for that. Um, and then we're going to be talking to uh, Casper and Martin Kanstrup from the Nordic region. Um, and they've been doing some small press, um, mostly Adventure League stuff. Uh, super excited to talk to them and learn a little bit more about how they're approaching game design over in their neck of the woods and getting into 5e stuff. And then... Um, I've got David Hartledge, and I don't know where I put my things, so that's all of them that I can remember off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm scheduling guests out through the rest of October, November, and December, so I'll have that guest list all done up soon, hopefully buttoned away. And uh, forward to chatting with all these people and learning so much stuff. Uh, so, so, everyone, uh, until next time, uh, that's it for this episode of the Designer's Den. Bye!